let me share the screen. Okay, so tonight, uh, good evening, first of all, and tonight we are going to discuss about individuals, the state, and the economic process. The things that we are going to, to, to touch tonight as a conclusive moment of our uh, Economics for Real People course are not disconnected with what we have seen in the past lectures, and in particular with what we have seen when we talk about price theory and price formation. So that is very crucial element. And uh, we will uh, focus on uh, the role of government in the economy and uh, the contradictions that are implied in government intervention. So I, I divided this uh, uh, lecture in, um, uh, in five parts, a brief introduction. Uh, then I will introduce the categories that are necessary for developing our uh, argument. Uh, so in terms of what is knowledge and which kind of knowledge is relevant in economic analysis. Then talking about government intervention, we will distinguish two parts. So the first part is central planning in a 100% planned economy. Okay, so what was an example under uh, USSR, what is Venezuela, so when the government owns the means of production. Then we will move to uh, the case that involves the majorities of the countries around the world, which is um, the case in which government intervene partially in the economy. So let's say mixed economy. And finally, we will see the relationship between uh, government intervention in the economy and the possibility of uh, absolute power for, uh, uh, for a government. Okay. So the introduction first. Uh, it is important to recognize that often the debate uh, on the uh, dualism between a market economy and a centrally planned economy or government intervention is conducted on a moral or ideological ground. But when usually you have a moral discussion, you never end. So usually people tend never to agree and it, be it becomes like a religious discussion. So the followers, the believers of the state, of the supremacy of the state versus the believer of the supremacy of the market. And note that here I call it market economy and not capitalism. Capitalism is a, is a word that I tend to avoid because it implies the usage of capital, whatever we mean about capital. But even in a centrally planned economy or in a socialist economy, we need capital. So to use the word capitalism, I think is terribly misleading because every economy is a capitalistic economy in the sense that it uses capital. So I rather use the dualism between a centrally planned economy and market economy, okay? And what I will try to do is to move the debate from an ideological ground to a theoretical and technical ground. So. Of course, we will be a little bit abstract, but I will try to use a level of abstraction that make the analysis uh, clear, uh, be understood. So, but, but it will be theoretical analysis. And um, allow me to say that in contemporary economics, we terribly need theory. There is a lot of attention to political economy, which means policy, but we almost lost the role of uh, the economist as uh, a theoretician, someone that uh, evolved a vision uh, over the working of the, uh, of the economic system. And the foundations of uh, uh, the argument that I'm going to use is uh, uh, the so-called socialist economic calculation debate that took place in Europe between the 1920s and the 1940s. As you know, uh, USSR as a totally central planned economy was born in 1917, so during World War I. And uh, uh, basically, 
at that time, it was emerging the question, can a centrally planned economy work and be an alternative to a market economy? And uh, two Austrian economists that have been mentioned over this class already many times, Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich von Hayek, developed two arguments to say, no, a centrally planned economy can't work. And they are called the economic calculation and knowledge problems. And we will discuss this uh, in the third part of this, uh, of this lecture. Let's go to uh, part two. First, we introduce the category of knowledge and two different types of knowledge. Here we go. And we start with an example. So here we have a picture of my friend Carmine, the owner of Mona Lisa uh, restaurant in uh, Artamas, Kuala Lumpur. So this is the slide that you have to present in order to get the discount. So slide number seven. Uh, and as you can see this picture, you see a pizza as it should be, okay? So this is the only way in which a pizza should be. There is no other way. Uh, so this is in between brackets. So uh, in order to develop uh, our arguments, let's take an example of opening a pizzeria. So which kind of knowledge do you need to start first and successfully run a pizzeria? And here we encounter two types of knowledge. Knowledge one is what we call technical knowledge. So when you have a pizzeria, someone needs to know how to make a pizza. This is uh, an obvious statement. Uh, despite these uh, two uh, brands down, they don't know how to make a pizza. So there are pizzerias in which people don't know how to make a pizza. These are hopefully exceptions, very popular in the United States, as you can see upstairs, uh, down in, in the slide. Now, the second type of uh, knowledge is what I call entrepreneurial knowledge, or what I called the knowledge of conditions of time and place. What does it mean? So it means that when you have to open a pizzeria, you don't simply need to know to, to, to know how to make a pizza, you need to make more complicated decisions. So which kind of customers should I target? At which price should I try to sell? How many people should I hire? Is this the right location? Should I choose uh, premium raw materials or cheap raw materials or, or, or a middle way? So there are a lot of critical decisions that the entrepreneur need to take. And these two types of knowledge are very different from each other. So knowledge of type one, technical knowledge, is indeed technical or scientific and is available to many, okay? Is somehow centralized in the sense that can be collected in, uh, in the brain of one certain or of one single person or one single entity. And it is clearly expressed, formulated openly, expressly in formulas, processes, or principles. So you can make a recipe of how to make a pizza. Okay. And this knowledge is pre existing, it exists before you start your own pizzeria. And it is easily communicated, easily in a certain way, via a process of formal teaching and learning. So you can teach other people how to make a pizza, okay? But you, as an entrepreneur, do not need necessarily to possess this kind of knowledge. So this kind of knowledge is not necessarily in the hands of the entrepreneur because the entrepreneur can hire what we call a pizzaiolo or a pizzaiola if he's a, if he's a lady, um, and someone to do the technical work, okay? So this kind of knowledge is not necessarily in the hands of <clears throat> the pizzaiolo. In fact, if you go to Mona Lisa, you will find that Carmine is not in the kitchen, okay? He's not the one cooking the pizza, okay? But also this lady is not the one cooking the pizza for you. 
the second kind of knowledge is completely different. First of all, is a, a subjective knowledge. So is, um, is different. It belongs to a certain specific person and it is practical, acquired through experience, is uh, exclusive. So usually it's not shared among different people. It is dispersed through the minds of different people. So every person in the marketplace possess a certain uh, bit of that information. It is tacit, it's not expressed in words. You cannot really teach how to be an entrepreneur. And it is uh, created from, uh, from nothing, ex nihilo, uh, through the exercise of uh, the entrepreneurial skills. And it is transmitted only via an extremely complex social process, which is mediated, as we have seen in, uh, uh, in the past lectures, uh, via the, via the uh, price mechanism, okay? And in fact, the, the study of how this kind of information is transmitted, generated and transmitted, is one of the core, should be at least one of the core objects of economic science, okay? This is precisely the knowledge that characterizes the essence of entrepreneurship. So an entrepreneur is such because he has, he has, he evolves through his action and interaction in, uh, in the marketplace, that kind of knowledge, okay? Uh, but which is completely different in nature from technical knowledge, okay? Now, keep this uh, information in your, uh, uh, in, your, uh, in your mind for a while, because this will become very useful for our argument very soon, okay? Uh, uh, with regard to this, uh, I would uh, quote myself, and uh, if you have in mind the debate, the debate that was quite vibrant up to, to a couple of years ago in Malaysia about one million affordable houses, Often on the press, there was the discussion, can really the government build 1 million affordable houses? If you read my, my papers on the topic and the comments that I released to the press, I always made the point that the issue is not really the technical possibility of building 1 million houses. The government can hire that knowledge, can entrust someone else to do it, can uh, hire engineers, architects to do it, can buy resources to do it. Uh, so that one is not the real point. The real point is, does the market need 1 million homes with certain specific features, location, prices? And how do we know if the market needs that kind of houses in a quantity of 1 million? This is the real question that an economist should ask. Not if the government can do. The government, if he wants, can do it. But does have an economic sense, an economic meaning to build 1 million affordable houses? And how do we discover that economic meaning? This is precisely the point that an economist should point out. And we will come back to this very soon. Now, let's move to central planning. Everything clear so far? There are questions because this is a very central point. So if someone, because I cannot see everybody of you here in the screen, if someone wants to ask something, just unmute yourself and uh, speak out, okay? Yeah, ciao, Carmelo. This, this yes. is similar to uh, business analysis, yeah, where the first, first point of engagement is the, your requirements planning, yeah? Yes. So we have to understand if there really is a requirement and what precisely is it, yeah? And otherwise you can never solve the problem, yeah. Yeah, and indeed uh, you mentioned the word planning. Here we will talk against central planning. And uh, what Hayek was saying, the issue is not planning versus not, not planning, but who plans for who? Mm. So Identifying we, the stakeholders so and key roles, yeah. We have, okay. we have, an, we have a, the government planning the economic activity for everybody. 
or it is a decentralized process in which the many plan for the many rather than the few plan for the many. So this is the, the key point. And now we will see what happened with central planning, why there is what we can call a logical contradiction that makes central planning actually impossible, okay? Now, so the first case that we examine is full socialism, whereby the government has the control of all the means of production, okay? So this is a very extreme case, still present nowadays in certain countries, uh, but has been very relevant in important economies like the Russian one and the Chinese one for almost a century. And uh, in fact, it is important to realize that there are probably more people that died in communist countries out of bad economic planning rather than the people that were really killed by the regime. So the, the, the people in the gulag, in the concentration camps. So what is, here is important, the category that is introduced by Mises, uh, the category of economic calculation. What is economic calculation? Is uh, the ability for economic actors to determine the, uh, the expected value added of a potential use of a, scar of a scarce resource, which means in a nutshell, is the ability for, for an economic actor, for an entrepreneur to guess, to try to risk the fact that the usage of certain economic resources now in a certain way will give, will produce a good that when placed in the market will give me a profit, okay? This is the essence of, of entrepreneurship. So to decide which resources to use, in which way to use them, to produce what, expecting that that one will be the activity that is rewarding, rewarded the most by the consumers. So will give me possibly the highest, uh, the highest return, the highest profit. Obviously, in order to have this kind of judgment, we need market prices. Because as we have seen in the past lectures, market prices capture the relative scarcity of resources and allow a comparison between cost and revenues. Because cost and revenues are expressed in the same unitary, in the same monetary uh, unit, then we can see after the uh, production process, if we have a profit or not. This is economic calculation. But it is important to realize that that prices exist only in a market economy. Because as we have seen in the, in the, at the beginning of this course, they are the synthesis of the different individual evaluation. And they are a means of communicating the scarcity, the relative scarcity and individual preferences over certain goods. So without property rights, that means without the possibility to exchange goods, we don't have prices. And in specific cases in which the government owns the means of production, without property rights in the means of production, we can't have prices of the means of production. And therefore, we cannot know which is the best way to use uh, that means of production for which usage and to obtain what. So we will never be able to determine if the usage of that means of production in a certain way generated a profit or a loss. This is the, in a nutshell, the, the, the issue of economic calculation. So without that market, there will not be money prices for the means of production. And without money prices for the means of production, a rational economic calculation is not possible because there is no way <coughs> for decision makers 
to judge the expected value uh, the expected value added of alternative courses of action. Okay, so you cannot know how to use what you have in your hands with the best economic possibility, because there is no market, and no market, no prices, no prices, no judgment over scarcity. So the problem is not technical. The problem is calculation problem. Okay. So we, we, we have seen, just to repeat and to emphasize this, that money prices emerge, okay, as the unintended outcome of the voluntary interaction of us, which we are a multitude of individuals that we, we all are pursuing our separate and often conflicting plans in a market setting, which is characterized by the private ownership that allow exchanges. Without private ownership, there are no exchanges. There are, without exchanges, there are no prices, okay? So the prices that emerge spontaneously in the market as a result of individual interaction convey the general knowledge about the relative scarcity of certain goods. And that is the main element for calculating how the resources should be used. So the problem again is never technical. In the absence of a price for market, uh, of, of an, in absence of the market for the means of production, it would be impossible for the central planning board to know which projects are economically feasible or not. Economically, not technically. So let's say you want to be to build a, a, a railway. It is technically possible, in example, to build a railway with gold. You can do that. It's technical feasible. But the problem is not the technical uh, possibility. The problem is the economic meaning. So is economically meaningful to build a railway with gold bars without a price for gold bars, we cannot know, okay? So this was the calculation argument developed by Ludwig von Mises, in particular with, uh, uh, with a paper published in 1920, okay? 1920, the economic calculation in the socialist commonwealth. Hayek who was a disciple of, of Mises enter at the beginning following his, his, his master and uh, uh, but later on developing uh, the what we call the knowledge problem which was uh, uh, developed mostly with two articles one in 1937 and one in 1945 these are all part of the readings that we we'll send to you uh, later on so um hayek argued that socialists conceived planning as possible because they assumed that knowledge was given, known and frozen. And uh, for the ones among you that have studied economics, this is not different from the approach that is used nowadays in uh, the so-called equilibrium analysis. When you study equi equilibrium economics, general economic equilibrium, you assume that all the knowledge is given, known, and frozen, which is not different from a, from, from a socialist um, uh, commonwealth, from a socialist organization. That's why at the first class, I told you that about my uh, um, unsatisfactory feeling with uh, unsatisfaction feeling with uh, mainstream economics, because when they define perfect competition, they define competition at that system in which technology is given, knowledge is given, everybody produced the same things without discriminating on price and without any uh, distinguished, distinguished uh, feature. And this is indeed what was happening under socialism. This is not competition. Competition is based on, is made, is based on differences. You compete in order to win, not to be equal. Okay, And you win by virtue of a difference, which can be better product, better price, uh, better communication strategy, whatever. 
corruption with the government, whatever reason, but it's by virtue of a difference. <clears throat> so Hayek emphasized the factor that to analyze, realistically speaking, an economic system means not to give knowledge as a given, as a data, but indeed it is studying the process through knowledge emerge, through which knowledge emerge. So the important thing, because if we, if we assume that knowledge is given, it's like if we are, uh, if we are saying that we know already the result, okay? So we, we assume in the assumption there are already the conclusions. So there is no point in describing the process because in that assumptions, there are already the, 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 the conclusions. So the whole economic life disappear from the analysis because you are describing a state of affair which is already implied into your assumptions. So assuming that you are a man, then you are a man. Is a tautology. But how you become a man? Okay. <clears throat> so because in, in, instead the market process, a real, vibrant, realistic market process is made of human errors, errors, and is constantly evolving, then focusing on a status of equilibrium where everything is already known, then is misleading, brings us to the wrong point of analysis. And then we come back to the two types of knowledge. So you, you, you remember, so the problem in, 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 a, in a central planning economy, they, they assume that experts can possess all the knowledge that is necessary to make the economy function. But experts can, in the best scenario, only possess the first type of knowledge, which is technical or scientific knowledge. But they cannot have the second type of knowledge, entrepreneurial knowledge. This is because that knowledge, as we have mentioned, is dispersed, tacit, and emergent. So it's not given, it's not like a recipe for pizza. It's something that you discover only by interacting, in acting and interacting in the market, okay? So you cannot know it in advance. You cannot know <coughs> in advance if your business plan is good. But indeed, this knowledge is the actual knowledge that is relevant to make sound economic plans. And in fact, experts are not entrepreneurs. And another thing, and this is very important in policy making, experts are not superhumans. They are like us. So when, when we think that expert, when the government is made a decision, you should figure out the government as made of human beings. So when you think about housing policy, you cannot simply think, oh, the government knows what is which one is a good housing policy you should go a little bit deeper and you should think oh zuraida knows which one is a good housing policy so if you replace zuraida uh, government with zuraida then your consideration about the superpowers of the government already start to shake right not because zuraida is uh, eventually less smart than other politicians this is uh, this I leave to your personal judgment, but because Zuraida is like all of us, just a human, and can't possess all the relevant knowledge that is necessary to make a sound housing plan, because that plan can only, the knowledge can only arise through action and interaction in the market. Okay, in the market process, while decision of policymaker are always taken outside of the marketplace. Okay, so government intervention actually attenuates, diminish economic knowledge 
and the ability of people to rely on economic calculation as a guide for deciding how to use the resources. Because they are going to cover that information with actions that are uh, putting a veil over what we can know, okay? Which eventually determine something like crowding out, in example, but it's not only the only effect that is generated. So this was central planning. Any question up to here? Just allow me one second to go and take a glass of water, yeah? And we'll come back soon. Okay, any questions so far? Sorry, I have a bit of a practical question, but I don't know whether it will be answered later in the presentation. Is you that can... why, um, like, uh, is that why policymakers usually it's very important for roundtable discussions, for uh, industry engagement to be able to understand the needs of the industry? Or, or will that actually, um, re uh, will, will that actually help? with understanding a bit more about the entrepreneurial side of knowledge. Okay, one thing is the conditions, let's say the institutional framework that the industry players need in order to, to have their life made easier. One thing is to make an industrial plan. These are two different things. So that one is something uh, in which the, the, thought, the decision is totally in the hands of the entrepreneur and the necessary knowledge is totally emerging in the market. Of course, part of the knowledge means also to know the institutional framework. That's why it's important that that, in, that framework doesn't change too often. GST, SST, GST nodes, SST, then GST again. That makes uh, entrepreneurial planning more complicated. Now, <clears throat> we move to the next step, which is interventionism, uh, which is uh, non-comprehensive planning. So when the government intervene only uh, partially in the economic system. This is a situation that we experience, I think, every day that we are very familiar with. Uh, often policymakers try to manipulate somehow the economic activity to align it to their goals. So this is also, I, I want to drive you into a change of mindset. So when the government decide that uh, a certain redistribution of income, in example, the government is, made, is making a, a, va a value judgment. So he's saying that uh, the division the that they have is better than uh, what would be determined only by the market. And again, also in this case, try to replace the world government with Muidin. So Muidin uh, vision is better than what would be determined by the market. Anwar vision would be better than what would be determined by the market. Najib vision is better than what would be determined by the market. So if you replace the world government with uh, you know, these uh, individual names, I think, again, that you can become more skeptical about the, the goodness of the vision in itself, okay? So obviously for uh, manipulating economic activity, uh, governments, the state needs discretionary power to replace the preferences of private economic actors with the preferences of policymakers, okay? And uh, this brings to economic effects, okay? 
And uh, these economic effects that often are bad unintended consequences bring in more intervention to address those effects. And therefore, when the, <coughs> when the government intervenes in the economy, there is a tendency to this economic intervention to become bigger and bigger. This is not something only theoretical. Think about what happened during COVID. Then you, everybody can have his own judgment, but government intervened with a certain policy to address the COVID emergency. This, that policy was the lockdown. The lockdown had some bad and intended consequences. That is the increase in poverty and unemployment. Then the government intervenes with another policy to address that problem, which is with government spending. But then government spending creates another problem, which is a higher level of debt. And that higher level of debt brings in another policy, which is taxes. And with more taxes, there will be less business opportunities and more unemployment. Uh, so there is a chain of effects that, uh, you know, uh, potentially is never ending. And this is very dangerous. And we will see in the last part of this, uh, of this presentation. So the, the, the underlying assumption of interven intervention is, is that policymakers have access to three types of economic knowledge that are necessary to engage in, uh, in planning to achieve their hands. So when government intervenes and we allow the government to intervene, we assume that policymakers knows way of allocating scarce resources that are superior to the alternative uh, provided by the market, okay? We assume that policymaker can adjust their intervention in face of something that keep on changing because the economic reality is, is always evolving. And we assume that policymaker would know what would have emerged without their intervention. So when we give space to government intervention, we are assuming that policymakers knows that the outcome without intervention is a certain outcome, that this outcome is worse than the outcome with government intervention, and that the government intervention can quickly adjust to a world in constant change. These are very strong assumptions about knowledge, always thinking that government is not a super entity, but is just a group of individuals. So we assume that that group of 15, 20 individuals can have this kind of knowledge. If you think at the names of all that, but, but even if you put the, 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 the highest level of experts in the world, whoever is running the government, we are, giving very, very strong assumption about their intellectual powers, okay? So in this case, the objections developed by Mises and Hayek still hold. In fact, without market prices uh, and profit and loss, there is no way for policymakers to know which one is the highest value added use of uh, uh, scarce resources. So policymakers need to play in the market, but they don't, they are not entrepreneurs. So policymakers cannot have superior knowledge and knowledge that is superior to the one of market participants on the best way to allocate resources, which is the condition of time and place. This is not because we individuals are better than policymakers. So policymakers are not better than us, but we are also not better than them. But by interacting in the market, we are engaged in, in, a, in a continuous and evolving process of exchange of information. So the outcome of this dispersed mechanism of decision is never perfect but better than a centralized one for the reason that we have seen so far. So because of the first point, 
then there is no way to ensure that the intervention will be revised and adjusted properly when condition changes. Because by nature, policymakers can be unaware of the fact that conditions change. Okay. And because the market by nature is an open ended process of competition, discovery, and change, then there is no way for policymakers to know which one would have been the outcome emerge through voluntary interaction without government intervention. Because we never know the, uh, when, 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 when you open, when someone is opening a business activity, you don't know if it will be successful or not. So there is never a way to know in advance the outcome of the market process. The outcome of the market process is open-ended, depends on endogenous conditions, on exogenous conditions, and on a process of choices that is made every day via interaction in the market. So when the policymaker assume that the market outcome would be worse than the intervention outcome, is making an assumption on something that they cannot know, not because they are stupid, but by nature, this information cannot be known in advance. Okay? Clear? Then, because policymakers, like everybody else, possess limited reason and knowledge to intervene in the market process, which instead is a complex system and impossible to grasp for a single uh, person, their actions generate unintended consequences. And these unintended consequences can hide current and future profit opportunities, okay? You produce government houses and you are hiding the fact that there may be profit opportunities for developers to build affordable homes, in example. Or in the, other, in the opposite case, government intervention can create entrepreneurial opportunities that <clears throat> do not enhance wealth that are there just because government intervention, okay? Like a monopoly uh, created by the government, okay? Then there is the creation of regime uncertainty. So it becomes more complicated for economic actors to gauge the future actions of government, okay? Car Carmelo, can I, can I just... Uh... Yes. Say, uh, yeah. There, what about uh, the underlying uh, aspects of corruption and uh, lack of enforcement as well? Yeah, that becomes this is, that, that this, is that, yeah. this is something that purposely I don't want to touch uh, because mm. I want to show that government intervention is a logical contradiction and practically impossible, even if we yes. assume okay. the best of intentions. Even Understand. if we assume yeah. uh, perfectly good individuals, so that's why I don't want to go into. Yeah, the, but but, but you, you touched on uh, policymakers. Okay, let's just assume that I have first-hand information because I've worked with an MP's office before. Mm -hmm. But even when you propose certain things with the policymakers, with the NGOs and the rest of it, yeah, and to be to be submitted to Parliament and PMO, the Prime Minister's office, the process is the the bureaucracy and the and the red tape involved is just overwhelming yeah and by the time it actually comes out yeah if you have 10 points probably 0 0.5 comes out so even though they got the, all these these brains working there the economist and everybody else in the round table it just doesn't happen you know i'm just saying i'm just putting it out there yeah yeah, yeah but, but these are important points but point that purposely i decided not to touch because the issue with government intervention is more deep than that Yes, I understand. Yeah. Because if the issue is corruption or uh, speed of decision and these kind of things, we can you can always have the objection that that things can be improved. 
but here there is something that is more ontological. So he's regarding yes. the nature about the DNA, of the DNA of it. Yeah, yes. I understand. Yeah. So he's uh, even if we assume perfect policymakers, angels, policymakers with the best intentions, <laughs> the best knowledge, and, and we have seen that uh, in example, the last government that was uh, established in Italy run by yeah. Mario Draghi, everybody yeah. welcome, welcoming Mario Draghi like, like the prophet Elijah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there is only, only one party that didn't vote uh, yeah. the confidence to this. So is a, is, a, is a government supported by everybody, left, right, north, south, mm -hmm. uh, whatever, all the cardinal points of the political spectrum. Yet, we, we can see that they are doing a complete disaster with Mario yeah, Draghi yeah. that can be a very... And, and this was soon after Berlusconi's uh, government, yeah? But Berlusconi yeah. is uh, out of power since 2013. Yeah, and even after that, the, the pro and, the, and, and against, yeah. But, but I mean, the, the point is precisely that Mario Draghi was welcome because he's not a mm -hmm. politician, because he's an economist, yeah. and everybody was saying he knows how to do things. Yep. But the problem here is not how to... To know how to do things because that is not what we need we don't need technical knowledge we need much more than that so yeah, clear yeah this is uh, uh the, the, this is the, the the point so somehow intervention in the economic system pose a threat to the entrepreneurial dynamism of the market process and opportunities can be lost probably you are familiar with what is so called the welfare economics which try to address so-called market failure and uh, to address uh, taxes or subsidies to make social, so-called social benefit or social welfare. It was developed by an economist called Pigou. That's why we call it Pigouvian taxes. Pigou was a disciple of Alfred Marshall uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And actually was the economist that Marshall preferred as uh, uh, his uh, replacement as a teacher in Cambridge uh, over John Minor Keynes. So both Keynes and Pigou were disciples of Marshall, but Marshall chose to put to give the chair to uh, to Pigou. Uh, the problem is that in welfare economics, the idea is that the market is like a computer, which there are inputs and outputs, and you can play with that. So you can adjust the outcome by changing the inputs, okay? But the market doesn't work like that. The market is an emergent order or a spontaneous order. You can find on our website a paper on the definition of spontaneous order, actually. So, and, and, and how spontaneous, so, so, so spontaneous order are not decided by anybody. They just emerge, okay? It, it, it's like, uh, is, is like a married couple. Nobody decides in advance, I mean, unless we. So we talk is about, it right uh, to assume that economists and uh, investment managers, for example, the one point that they cannot meet is the efficient market uh, hypothesis? Yeah. So you would you, you you're not a proponent of that. Sorry again, I didn't understand. The, the efficient market theory, you know. If, so yeah. I guess the economists will think beyond just the market uh, efficiency because there's always. Uh, skewed and, uh, you know, skewed information, yeah. The, the point is, uh, of course, I'm not talking only about financial markets here. When I mean market, I mean really the market where goods and, and things are exchanging and produced and choices are made. But the old definition of uh, market failure and mar efficient market is based on the assumption that we can imagine a threshold in advance. So if we want to say that the market is not efficient, uh, it implies that we can say when a market is efficient, yeah. according to which criteria. And I contend that we don't have the knowledge to assume yes. that. Yes, uh, understand. Okay. Clear? Agreed, agreed, yeah. We, we, Besides we don't. just information asymmetry. So, yeah. Like when we say that that is a market failure, it means that we assume to know what, what would be the perfect outcome. But how can one individual say that that would be the perfect outcome? There is a what, Halle, uh, what Hayek call um, uh, pretense of knowledge there, that is very dangerous. Mm. Okay. Okay. So, and, and here yes. is my point. Even if we assume that government official, official genuinely seek 
<coughs> sorry, to um, develop, to, to improve economic conditions in the name of the public interest, interest okay? The economic analysis, the economic theory demonstrates that when you interfere with the competitive market process, you produce results that are often contrary to the betterment of the public. Okay. An example, look, I, I, I speak about the housing policy because it's something that I work extensively. While the Malaysian housing policy aimed genuinely out of good feelings to provide houses for the poor, the actual outcome was that many poor have been preserved in the status of poverty, because in order to provide them a cheap house, they have been relegated in bad locations, impeding social mobility. So they have remained poor, but with a house, but their condition didn't really improve and was even worse than because they didn't have access to better opportunities with another bad outcome that was an increase in household debt. Okay, so the, the, the intention was good, but you know, of good intentions are paid the ways to hell, we were, used, we were used to say. So final point, government intervention and power. This is very delicate because uh, indeed you see we are crossing our uh, reason, reasoning uh, between economic analysis, a little bit of philosophy, uh, epistemology, and also theory of power. So beyond the knowledge problem, there is another issue uh, with the government planning in economic activity. This planning tends to centralize discretionary power in the hands of a small group of policymakers. Okay. And planning, in fact, requires that policymakers substitute their goals and desires for those of the private actors in the market. <coughs> this develops an overarching blueprint of what the economic outcomes should look based on the vision of the policymakers. So the policymakers say, no, the system should be like that. So they decide in advance which one should be the economic outcome. Okay, and this is uh, dangerous in a way that we will see uh, very shortly. The market process instead, guided by prices, leads to an order which is spontaneous and unplanned by any single mind. So there is nobody that decide which goods are actually brought to the market. There is no single individual in a market economy, not a single planning entity that decide what you eat. In the market, our preferences are communicated via market prices so that production can be adjusted to the way consumers want, okay? In fact, it's quite striking. If you look at the automotive industry in a planned economy in USSR and uh, in a market economy in the Western world back in the 70s uh, or in the 80s, we had in the Western world, plenty of uh, cars, different models, colors, shapes, engines, and whatever. In USSR, there was one for everybody, okay? So the point was to make the car, but the point is not to make the car, like also our dear Dr. M had in mind. The point is never having the technology to produce a certain good. The point is, producing what the people need and what the people want. Technology will come if it is allowed to come. If you put the government in terms of giving that answer, then you are blocking technology from evolving because nobody will develop solutions in order to go in competition with the government. Okay, so somehow that intervention can become even um, uh, a way to diminish the possibility for a country to develop, okay? Because if there is a need for cars in a market, the market will provide that cars. There will be technological development to provide that solution. But if that solution is answered directly by the government in a way 
that is messy like always, then there will be no private intervention to answer to that question because nobody would want to compete with government intervention. But then the point here of this part is that with this action, policymakers must identify a predefined set, a predefined set of events that they believe should exist. So they would define in advance what the society should work for. And once they substitute their vision for the wants and the goals of the private individuals, then the economic knowledge that somehow emerge through the market process will be distorted or lost. Unintended consequences are produced. Think in example, at scarcity due to price control. When you put price control, then you can face potentially uh, scarcity, okay? And this is a way in which the outcome of the market process is, no, is lost. In response to these unintended consequences, policymakers has usually two options. Number one, to remove the initial intervention. So, okay, we realize we did something wrong, we stop it, and this is very rare. Usually, they introduce, you introduce additional policies to address the intended consequences. And this process will never end. And as we mentioned earlier, in order to design, implement, and enforce intervention, government planners need some discretionary power. Okay. But uh, the unintended consequences force policymakers to expand the scope of such discretionary power. We are experiencing, in example, in example, a status of emergency in Malaysia, which is the extreme expansion of the scope of discretionary power. So democracy is suspended, basically. We don't realize because we go out, we are all consumers, we eat, we drink, our belly is full, we are not put in jail, but we don't realize that democracy is suspended in this country. So the will of the people is threatened, is not respected. The MPs that you are that you elected to represent yourself and to do your will are basically useless, still getting their salary yet through your taxes. So it is important to appreciate the link between interventionism and political power. Because this has implications on the rule of law as a means of preventing abuses of government power. So we need absolutely in advance binding rules on government actors in order to limit the abuse of arbitrary power. Okay, this is very, very important. And economic planning somehow necessarily violates the rule of law because planners must have discretion to address unforeseeable situations that cannot be anticipated ex ante. So interventionism requires not only that policymakers impose their vision to others, but also that they are willing to use the force to punish deviations from their plans. Okay, and this is obviously a threat to the freedoms of private individuals. As planning grows because of the requirement to use force, there is also a growing tendency for the worst members of society to rise to power. This was also an argument developed by Hayek, saying somehow democracy in a, in a, in a mixed economy in which there is a government intervention tends to select to select the worst to go to the power. So it's not the case that the worst rise to the power. It's uh, in, inscribed into the mechanism because a government that is expected to intervene is a government that needs to use the force to punish deviation from their plans. 
remember that last year, for many, many months, we had more people jailed for lockdown violations that people getting sick with COVID. We had maybe 20, 30 people getting sick for COVID and 700 people jailed for violation of the lockdown. So in order to, 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 to have the possibility to use the force, you have to have people that accept the compromise of doing, of doing this. And usually good people don't want to do this. So they leave space to the wars to go to the power. Okay, so and th this is a, a logical argument. So markets are a defense in this. Markets, first of all, address the knowledge problem and the calculation problem that we have seen so far. But they also become a constraint on political and private power over the lives of private persons because they limit uh, the number of decisions that policymakers need to make and limits the private power because markets are contestable. So markets, new players can enter the market. So this is why the market is uh, superior under many perspectives, not perfect, but superior uh, to the action of uh, central, to, to the central action of policymakers. That's all. Uh, at the end here, I put the basic readings uh, that will be distributed to you um, later on, and also further readings, books to, um, uh, to deep the knowledge of this topic. And I will send over also all these books because I have the electronic version of all these books. So I will, I will send over to you later. So I've been uh, faster enough to give a good amount of time to, uh, the, um, to, the, to, to the question and answers. So I see here, okay, uh, Zulaika has a question. You want to make it, uh, Zulaika, by, by voice, the question that you have written here in the chat box? Uh, yeah, I'm actually outside right now. Can you oh, hear okay. me? Yeah, we can yeah. hear it. Yeah, just my question. I haven't really read into the theory of the entrepreneurial state, but I from what I understand, like in the US, right? The, for example, the internet technology and then the creation of iPhone, the, the infrastructure was developed by the government, by government funding. So, you know, there are instances like government intervention or government provision of infrastructure is important. So um, how does what you presented just now, what intervention is and yeah, fits into that. Yeah, um, so the, in, the, the state as an entrepreneur is a contradiction in terms. Uh, this doesn't mean that something can come out right, because uh, in situations like the one that has been described, like the United States, but even China now, uh, the state is not completely um, unaware of what is happening in the market. Okay, so it can be uh, that something is developed that is good, but this happened by chance. And in fact, there has been technology that have been developed by the state that become useless. Okay, that, so the, the, the whole point is not that the government being able to develop technology, that can be done, you can have a research center, but the point is that to make technologies that are uh, accepted by the market at relevant market prices. This can happen, can have a positive outcome, and the more the economy is open, the highest is the chance for a government plan somehow to, to, to have um, a certain degree of success. But uh, then again, in, a, in the marketplace, that kind of check happens always. You cannot bring you cannot spend the resources, you cannot bring to the market something that is not accepted. So you are immediately wiped out of the market. Instead, when the government spend money, 
think about the lunar uh, the, the lunar run in the 60s, US and uh, Russia competing to go on the moon. For sure, this brought some, techno some important technological development, but this is a technological development that somehow didn't have repercussion on the life of people in the market. Uh, Who is going to the moon now? Nobody. So, and all this technological development has been done with our money, by the way. Uh, for a struggle of power between two superpowers that have used our money to win that race for a technology that nobody use. In the market, entrepreneurs, first of all, they use their money. So they are not asking your money to do something to take a risk. So they bear the responsibility of their failure. While when the government fail, you bear the responsibility of this failure. Which is very different, and and, uh, and secondly, they have always the the check in the market. So a mistake in the market can be rapidly corrected because you realize immediately if your business is not something wanted by the people, and you so the possibility to reshape resources in a most useful way can be addressed immediately, while the government, for several reasons can keep on investing money and resources in something that nobody wants just for the sake of the fixation of policymakers. Again, here we have the case of Dr. M that when, went back in power in 2018, said, ah, we have to have another national car. And the point is, do we need that? And who is going to pay for it? So a private enterprise, a private entrepreneur is never asking you money to take a risk. The government does. So there is a, an important difference here. And you bear the cost of the failure. More questions? So, hi. I actually have uh, one question for you. Is that um, you know that Nowadays, a lot of these policymakers is uh, trying to make these uh, free trade agreements with one country and with another countries, uh, and then sometimes they are not favors in another ones. So, what what do you see on this one? Should um, because again, these are all policymakers is plans by um, it's not plans by the entrepreneur, and they are doing like a by one country and then sometimes another country as a revenge, they follow as well as you can see in the US and China uh, uh, trades uh, barriers that they are imposing. So what do you see on this and uh, what's your view? I think that uh, the, the, the very fact that we need the free trade agreements in order to have free trade is against free trade. If it has to be free, it doesn't need to, to be written anything. <laughs> Uh, you simply put zero duties, no duties at all, that is free. You don't need 500 pages of agreement. When you need 500 pages of agreement, then it's no more a free trade. There are so many rules, then what, what is free there? You have to look in which comma they are trying to screw you. Uh, so if you want to have a free trade agreement, you sit down, you take a piece of paper and you write, we can exchange all goods at zero duties. Signature one, signature two. This is a free trade agreement. The rest is uh, the attempt to screw each other. Sorry for very direct answer, but. <laughs> Thank you, sir. More questions? Ciao, yes. Um, the slide on power uh, yeah. was very intriguing. Uh, I think it's the second slide on power. Can you? Can you, if you don't mind, can you go back there? Yeah. If you don't mind, yeah? Yeah, no problem. Let me... Towards the end, yeah. This one? Uh, I think the one before, can you? Okay, after? Yeah, okay. The predefined set of ends that they believe should exist, yeah? Yes. I've, I've got a two part, maybe three part, I don't know, yeah? 
uh, question. The first one is the predefined set of ends. Okay, so a question is, one of the, and it's quite sensitive because being in Malaysia and uh, you, you, you've been around, so you know quite well, you know, where I'm coming from. The set of ends in holding power, um, what if they are not exactly aligned to what it should be, number one? Number two, are you a proponent of the ends justify the means? And um, yeah, the two parts. Okay. If you can elaborate on that as well, yeah. Again, my, my, my position will be very, uh, very direct on this. Um, we should have no ends. Uh, <clears throat> in the sense <laughs> that uh, um, somehow to define the hands implies a moral judgment. Uh, and I would uh, not leave the setup of ends to, the, to a handful uh, number of people. So we all have our ends, our individual ends. We struggle every day to achieve our ends. We imply our, so we, we deploy our resources. We do purchases, we do sales, and we, we try to achieve our hands. And the market is that place in which our <coughs> conflicting ends somehow get uh, uh, coordinated because we need, uh, we need each other somehow. So uh, we, we don't need to decide consciously to cooperate, but because of the nature of human interaction, we end up cooperating. Uh, so in the morning, I want to have breakfast. I don't need mm -hmm. someone that love me so much to produce eggs. I need someone that want to have a profit and in order to have a profit, produce eggs and someone that for a profit distribute eggs with a truck and someone that for a profit put eggs in the supermarket and then I can go and buy my eggs. So this cooperation is uh, spontaneously happening, okay? But we don't need the government to set up the target that Carmelo needs to eat eggs in the morning, okay? because that will happen anyhow. Otherwise the government can set up the target that I should eat something different. Like I think it was in the, in the United States when there was uh, uh, a growing Italian community at the, the, the beginning of the 20th century, they tried to convince the Italians to eat hot in the morning uh, while we usually eat sweeties in the morning, croissant and biscuits and bread. In the old times we were using mm -hmm. a lot of bread in the morning with, uh, with oil and these kind of things. And the Italians were saying they want to turn us into chicken, uh, eating grains <laughs> in the morning. You know? so, yeah. <laughs> so, um, if we are allowed to operate in the market, I will find someone that produced the bread that I want to eat in the morning, uh, but should not be the government to decide what I'm going to eat in the morning. Um, on that, if I may add on, right, I feel like there's an assumption that the market is completely free where we all have our hands on it. Isn't it also being controlled? by the private hands of the ultra rich or corporations. For example, corporations having advertisements that tell you, you should have bread in the morning for breakfast. You should eat this amount of eggs. So it's not you know, entirely free. I feel like the comparative probably be either private powers of elected reps or private powers of ultra rich corporations. Um, uh, is, is difficult for, is uh, different for, uh, for, di for several reasons. So in the case of government decide what you eat in the morning, you have no choice. Uh, so if the government is not trying to convince you to eat oat over bread, the government forces you to eat oat over bread. In the case of a corporation, obviously this is part of the contending process in the market, the power of persuasion. We all try, we all bring something to the market and we try to persuade others that our product is better than the products of others for several reasons. And, uh, but we still have our freedom of choice um, and is ultimately me to decide what to eat despite a potentially strong power of persuasion from a multinational company. Um, the, 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 the point from the institutional framework should be that the market is always contendable. Not that there is no monopoly, but that monopoly, if it is created naturally, it is contendable. So there is a multinational that is trying to convince me to eat all, there is someone else that can offer something else. So the conditions, and then where the government actually has a role, 
in granting the respect of the rule of law and uh, private property and uh, the, the, the property rights. That is where indeed there is, there is a role of control. More questions? Uh, so you're saying that monopoly can happen with or without the government intervention? Yes, monopoly can happen in different ways. Um, I also intervened on this in the case of Grab last week on the press. Um, monopoly can happen because of a government decision. An example, the government in Malaysia, I think advocate for a for himself, the, the, the role of supplying energy, okay? And this is a, a monopoly created by the government. Um, then uh, uh, there is a monopoly that happens by violating rules, an example, or by chronic capitalism. So by the collusion between uh, private enterprises and government power. So is um, something beyond that, that should be avoided. But there are also monopolies that happen naturally and actually this is in the nature of capitalism. If you read that uh, literary ma masterpiece in economics, that is a masterpiece also from the way in which it's written, that is the theory of economic development published by Schumpeter in 1911, is really a masterpiece in which he described the process of creative destruction and the essence of competition. When, uh, when an, an entrepreneur enters with the market with a new product or a new technology or whatever, it enters by with the will to become the dominant in that market, okay? And it is perfectly natural. And, and it is normal that in example, when, when Microsoft entered with a certain innovation, it became a monopoly because there was nobody else doing that thing. They were smarter in the market for whatever reason. That is the same what happened with Grab. Grab challenge the monopoly that was in the in the taxi industry broke it and won a different mon uh, dominant position which is perfectly uh, legitimate the important thing is that the market remain open to new contenders so like like grab broke uh, the monopoly of the traditional taxi someone else can try to broke to break uh, grab monopoly so that is what we should eventually control and monitor, but not the fact that Grab was good enough and smart enough and uh, entrepreneurial enough to win. Indeed, the essence of competition, the real competition, if we want to talk about what is competition, not in the fiction of the textbooks, but in the reality, is the competition between people that try to do new things and people that uh, try to keep alive the old way to do things. Read Schumpeter. Mortal sin if you don't read Schumpeter. Yeah, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. I have a question. Uh, one of Hayek's books, The Road to Serfdom. Yes. Can you explain a bit on um, the, the role of the government to provide minimum food, shelter, clothing, piece of health? capacity yes. to work and things like this and other than um, you, what you explain about like ensuring property rights in the case of a in a case in the theoretical case of Hayek's government what would then other than these be the role of government I agree that that uh, that statements from Hayek were <laughs> quite controversial within uh, Hayek uh, environment and was a uh, a case for, a, for, for quite a, a distancing between him and Mises, in example. Um, but um, what actually Hayek is saying is that there are uh, social issues that we cannot disregard them and that there should be responsibility uh, to take care of these issues. So in, in fact, there is the, the misleading idea that uh, market economists, free market economists are against the poor. No, we, we're not against the poor. We're just trying to say that there is a better way to address the problem of the poor. 
and usually this way comes from the market mm. the market can provide better solutions than uh, centralized solutions we like to say that the government usually the socialists like so much the poor that they would like to grow the number of them okay uh, so this is where i extend on, on this also in the realm of a very uh, strict institutional framework that he described in a three volume books called law Leg legislation and liberty uh, which is very important so we should look at the, 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 i mean the road of serfdom is a very popular book mm. uh, and it was designed to be popular okay so it was not a book in economic theory it was a book to uh, to reach the masses and so he had to simplify certain ways but it was not uh, a book in economic theory so we have also to, to realize that in fact i think that it's probably a book that i haven't read of <laughs> because uh, i like more is uh, technical works in economics that are very little known actually mm. yeah so what is the role of government then uh, i mean in a fully free market economy in what the role of in, government? In, I mean, in a in a free market economy, what would the role? I mean, uh, okay. so other than crime prevention and property rights, is there anything else that government? And then there are, you know, also in the in the free market environment, there are different yeah. positions that go from uh, the classical liberal to the libertarian and to a group of radical people called the anarcho-capitalists. Uh, that while the classical liberals uh, believe. Uh, in an idea of a minimal state to defend, to provide an institutional framework that mm. defend freedom, uh, defend property rights, uh, and, and, and also uh, in the case of Adam Smith, uh, Adam Smith was also advocating for a role of government in education, in defense, in example. Uh, then uh, the, the radicals like the anarcho-capitalists uh, led by Murray Rothbard believe or even Hans Hermann Hoppe uh, believe that there is we can do without the government at all so they believe in a small self-organized society uh, and communities uh, in which even defense is a privately run uh, you know and paid via insurances uh, private insurance so these are there are actually the different shades in the in the market environment I tend to identify myself mostly with the classical liberals. So where there is uh, the need for a minimum institutional organization, at least to uh, preserve uh, the defense and the respect of property rights and uh, to, to, to create an institutional framework um, that allow also entrepreneurship to emerge at, at best. Okay. But I really want, I mean, the, the, the key points that I want you to bring home tonight are these two, that there, there, there is a problem in government intervention beyond also the issue of power, where there is a technical, a logical contradiction in when the government tries to intervene in the economy. And this is summarized in the two problems, the calculation problem. So you don't have market prices, then you cannot know which one is the best way to use the resources. Second, the knowledge problem. While the government can possess technical knowledge to do things, while the government can know how to do things, the government struggle to know what to do. And if what they want to do is actually what the people want. Okay, so you, you, you can build a train made of gold, but it will be totally anti-economical, okay? Especially in the desert. <laughs> yeah, especially in the desert. So we, we have... But that's clear. Those two points are very clear, Camilo. Thank you so much. Mm. Excellent. And, uh, I think I made this example during the first class when I was used to travel to China. Uh, uh, at the border with North Korea and uh, uh, and Mongolia, in the in the middle of the desert, looking for chicken farms, 
uh, I was traveling through beautiful highways, eight lanes highways with the, the ticket counters and everything, but there were no cars. Mm. So again, the production of that highways brought up the GDP because uh, government mm. spending is a positive element of GDP, but there was no economic meaning in doing that. Here you can see yeah, ghost towns in China mm. indeed. Um, and, and that's the whole problem with the 1 million affordable houses. Do we need that? Do we need the third national car? We can even answer that we don't need 1 million affordable houses, but we need 2 million. So the problem is not necessarily to do less. Maybe we need more. But the answer to that question is only available in the, is only available and emerging in an, evolu in an evolutive way, in an evolving way in the market. So cannot, it's a decision that cannot be taken outside of the marketplace. For, for, for me, I, ha, I have, have actually been like thinking over about the establishment of institutions. That institutions are set out to, to facilitate the operation for a certain purpose. But I see that the established as uh, institutions may turn out to be inefficient and away from the original purpose. How is, yeah, I, I just like, it's a thought and then I'm thinking how to solve because institutions are set out to, to facilitate certain purposes, but turn out that in, institutions are inefficient to carry out and may even de, uh, dis, delay that particular purpose. Mm. Yeah. Uh, okay, actually, there is also some, some, some time a little bit of confusion about the word institution, because uh, when we think about institution, we always think about the government. So, but uh, there is more about that. In example, prices are institutions in the sense that they communicate information and they smooth the way in which we take decisions. Institutions are not only the formal institutions, there are also informal institutions. I don't know if I made here this example, but I did often this example to my students. Take highways in Malaysia, okay? Uh, it's quite striking for, uh, for someone coming from abroad, the fact that people tend to drive in the middle lane, while the, 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 the way the, the formal institution should be slow on the left, uh, overcoming in the middle, super fast in the right, okay, more or less. Here in Malaysia, it works in a different way. Slow in the middle, overcoming left and right, okay? Uh, and yeah. and it, 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 is, it is like that, and it works. It works because it's a non-written rule accepted by the individual. So it's a spontaneous rule that overcame in power and efficacy the formal rule. Everybody accept the fact that you should be in the middle. For whatever reason, I don't know. My colleague Nick explained to me that people in Malaysia feel safer by driving in the middle. So they decide last minute going left, going right. They are in the middle, so they are equally distant from left and right. Uh, but for me, for me that I'm a foreigner coming from a different Culture of driving is complicated because all of a sudden people switch from the middle to the exit in the highway, and it should not be the case. Um, but for you, it's not a problem because you have accepted that as part of your uh, uh, of your rule, and that happens. And that helps traffic to work smoother, uh, smoothly in Malaysia because everybody accepts that set of rules. So indeed, as I think we mentioned in the first lecture, there are institutions that facilitate the market process, so help the market process to give a better result. There are institutions that are an obstacle to that. And the heavier the institution, uh, the more difficult is for the market process to produce is beneficial um, is beneficial uh, outcomes.
So in example, now uh, the government is keeping on saying that they want to have business travelers uh, to come in, okay? And to come back to Malaysia. But if you look at the regulations and how this should happen, in which you have to have a government official to follow in you wherever you go, uh, to follow in you where you go to eat, and you have to pay for the meals and the transportation of this government official, which is not necessarily someone that you like to have around, uh, then makes things more difficult. So that is an institution, but it is an institution that makes things more difficult. <clears throat> more questions? That's all. Okay. So if it's all for tonight, I, I thank you. I leave uh, then uh, uh, Veronica in charge to arrange the Buca Puasa at Mona Lisa for, uh, for all the participants. So as you, you made the proposal, so you will be in charge of the oh, wait, sorry, Camilo, what, what book of what arrangement? Can you elaborate, please? Oh, because you enter a little late. Uh, okay, uh, so, we discussed that yeah. uh, Sugi will pay the bill. <laughs> Who? You Me? will be paying the bill. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, you, you don't, don't worry, don't worry. You, you don't need I'll to... I'll pay the bill with all your money. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, it's like because just now Camaro actually discussed. Uh, he actually uh obtained like ten percent discount for us in and right, 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 right. And Mona Lisa, yeah, yeah, Mona yeah. Lisa, yes. Uh, okay, okay. So I so uh, Veronica suggested that rather than going individually, we are going all together. Yeah, that'll be beautiful. Yeah, to sure. celebrate the end of uh, economics for real any people. Any idea when any date set? Let's let's uh, Veronica to elaborate and decide without democratic process uh, because <laughs> the, <laughs> democratic institutions <laughs> tend to be. You know, Camilo, honestly, uh, you should be a politician. <laughs> I, I should be what? A politician. <laughs> uh, I, I had my first dose of, uh, of politics when I was a young fellow in Italy. <laughs> oh then, yes, yes, yes. Then the system. But that was a long me. time ago. Now things have changed. Now you know. <laughs> then the system. The system expelled me. No, 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 <laughs> no way. You expelled like, yourself. You have Malaysia, things I to do. Talk, I'm a foreigner, so I. You're making too much money. <laughs> anyway, Camilo, thank you so much. Yeah. Beautiful, well, beautiful session. Beautiful. Thank, thank you. Thanks, everybody. So I will. Uh, so I will we wait for when okay. Okay. Bye bye. For, for a pizza and uh, have a good evening. Thank you, That's Dr. Camelo. Thank After you so much. After eight classes, you don't have a closing remarks or anything. <laughs> no, <laughs> but, but, uh, bye, but, you guys. Screw you yeah, guys. <laughs> you, 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 you are actually right, Lini. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I was very happy to have you all, all here. That is uh, obvious. I don't hide the fact that the organization of this uh, class has been also quite demanding in terms of my personal energy. So if this event is going to be reproposed, I will have Cellini uh, doing the organizational part. <laughs> okay, so okay. I can focus on the contents and, uh, and not uh, on, the, uh, on the organization. So uh, the future of this class depends on Cellini. <laughs> so this well you, 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 yeah, you, you, you must continue, Camelo. You must continue, please. Mm. And uh, also, Camelo, can, can I suggest the uh, the part one we did before on free market economics? Please continue there as well. Yeah, I think I, I was thinking I had in mind for a, for a second module based more on yes, please the deeper topics in economics or so capital theory, business cycles, and, and this mm. of course. And, and then I think perhaps can can create a private uh, Facebook group to you know to connect the the the, the